تعجل بالقرآن من قبل أن يقضى إليك وحيه وقل رب زدني علما إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستوهره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد So in the last lesson then we had started the chapter regarding seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife We mentioned that the aqidah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, but that we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife. As for the people of innovation, they had gone astray on both sides. So some of the people of innovation claim that we cannot see Allah in this world and neither can we see Allah in the afterlife. And that is misguidance. And the other side of the deviated groups, they say that we can see Allah in the afterlife and in this life. And that is incorrect to the correct position, the correct aqidah that is demonstrated by the evidences is that we cannot see Allah in this world but we will see Allah in the afterlife. We mentioned some of the evidences already in the previous lessons. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala had mentioned the ayah from Surah Al-Qiyamah 22 and 23 وجوه يومئذ ناظرة إلى ربها ناظرة That faces on that day shall be bright, radiant, glowing, looking at their Lord. That is a clear evidence that the believers will look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife. And with this particular ayah, when it mentions, إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةً The fact that you have the preposition إِلَىٰ in this ayah along with نَاظِرَةً indicates linguistically that this must be a literal meaning of eyesight, of vision, that the believers, their faces will be glowing and bright and radiant, looking at their Lord. And as we mentioned, some of the scholars, they said that when the believers see Allah on that day, then as a consequence of that, their faces become bright and glowing and radiant. And others, they said actually, the believers are prepared in advance to see Allah and their faces are made radiant and glowing and bright in preparation to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was one evidence. Another evidence that we spoke about was an evidence 
that the people of innovation actually try to use to say that you cannot see Allah. But in fact, it is an evidence for Ahlul Sunnah proving you will see Allah. And that was the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-An'am 103, That the eyesight, they cannot encompass him, but he encompasses them. The people of innovation said, This ayah is an evidence that we cannot see Allah. Because Allah tells us our eyesight cannot encompass the sight of Allah. But they misunderstood the ayah is actually a proof that we will see Allah. Because encompassing something is different to merely seeing something. And encompassment occurs after vision occurs. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates from us encompassment of seeing Him, then that is therefore an affirmation that there will actually be seeing of Allah, there will be a seeing of Allah, but there will not be an encompassment. So the people will see Allah, but from His might and majesty, they will not be able to comprehend and encompass the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is being negated in the ayah? is not the sight, the fact that they will see Allah, what is being negated is a level above that. The comprehension and encompassment of seeing Allah and the greatness of Allah, that is negated, but the actual sight is not. And in fact, the fact that comprehension or or encompassment of the greatness and might and majesty is negated is a proof that sight will occur. Because if we were not going to see Allah in the first place, then obviously there would be no possibility of us encompassing the sight of Allah. So then what would be the purpose of negating that if we were never going to see Allah in the first place? The ayah is therefore a proof we are going to see Allah, but that we will not encompass what we see from the might and majesty of Allah. So that is in fact an evidence that we will see Allah, not as the people of innovation attempted to use it, as an evidence that we will not. And that is just like we mentioned, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, if the people of innovation use an authentic evidence to try and prove some innovation of theirs, then it must mean that they are using that authentic evidence in some incorrect way, because the authentic evidence would never prove an innovation, an authentic evidence, an ayah from the Qur'an, or an authentic hadith, it would never prove an innovation. So the fact that they are using ayat or established a hadith to try and prove their innovations must mean they are misinterpreting those authentic evidences. So Shaykh al-Islam said in that case, If the innovators, the people of misguidance, they use an authentic evidence to try and prove their innovation, they must be misusing it. So you use it 
the same evidence in the correct way to rebuke them. So now this ayah, لا تدركه الأبصار They are misinterpreting it and misusing it. So you use the same ayah by giving them the correct interpretation and understanding of it. And the very ayah then becomes a rebuke upon them when they thought it was an evidence for them. Then also, we had mentioned the second ayah that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala stated, عَلَى الْأَرَائِكِ يَنْظُرُونَ that they are upon their thrones looking. What will they be looking at? Then this was highlighted in the explanations and the tafsir that they will be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will see all of their kingdom and the greatest of what they are blessed with is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then also, from the evidences that were mentioned in regards to the aqidah of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah in seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the third ayah from Surah Yunus. Aya 26 لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةِ For those who do good, those who are upon iman and righteousness and piety and obedience, then for them is الْحُسْنَى which is paradise. For them is paradise. But then on top of that Allah says, Waziyada. That on top of being given paradise, they will be given extra. So now the question is, what is the meaning of this extra that the people of paradise will be given? on top of paradise and all of the blessings within it, then as we mentioned, there is a hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ himself clarified and gave the tafsir of what that ziyada is. And so it is mentioned in the hadith that the ziyada, it is a nazar ila wajhillah. That it will be seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That tafsir, we have taken it directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the one who has given us the tafsir of this ayah that they will have paradise and more. What more could they have on top of paradise than that is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is proven by the tafsir of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself in an authentic narration in Sahih Muslim hadith of Suhaib radiyallahu anhu. Then also, we have the fourth ayah where Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ They will have whatever they desire therein in paradise they will have whatever they desire. But then Allah says, وَلَدَيْنَا مزيد. And we have even more for them. They will have all of what they want. 
But even after that, Allah says, we still have more for them. So what more could there be if the people of paradise have got everything they want? What more could they be given? Then once again, this is explained uh, in the narrations and in the tafsir as being seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there was the fifth ayah, which we also mentioned last time. And that was the ayah from Al-Mutaffifin, ayah number 15, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَرَّبِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ that nay, they will be veiled from their Lord on that day. Who will be veiled and blocked from seeing their Lord on that day? Then of course that is in reference to the disbelievers, the unbelievers, the disbelievers, the kuffar. They will be veiled from seeing their Lord on that day. But then how is that an evidence that the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then it is, as the scholars mention, the mafhumul mukhalafa, that you can take the opposite evidence from that, infer and deduct the evidence from it. How? Because if Allah is telling us that the kuffar are going to be blocked, veiled from seeing Allah on that day as a punishment upon them, that must therefore mean that the believers will not be veiled from seeing Allah. Because if it did not mean that, and the believers were also going to be veiled from seeing Allah on that day, then what difference would there be between the believers and the disbelievers? Cannot be that on the day of judgment the believers are equal to the disbelievers. Allah tells us the disbelievers will be veiled. The mafhum al the opposite inference that can be made, is therefore that the believers will not be veiled. They will be honored and they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is an evidence that can also be used Al-Imam Shafi'i mentioned that as an evidence, as did many other scholars, to say that we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. Nevertheless, despite all of these evidences and more we have not mentioned, the people of misguidance refuse to accept. And they insist on clinging to certain misinterpretations of theirs with other evidences, trying to prove that you can never see Allah. That was one side of the argument with the people of innovation, the side who say you can never see Allah in this world and in the afterlife. And one of the evidences they use is in Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 143. وَلَمَّا جَاءَ مُوسَى لِمِيقَاتِنَا وَكَلَّمَهُ رَبُّهُ قَالَ قَالَ رَبِّ أَرِنِي أَنْظُرْ إِلَيْكَ 
قال لن تراني ولكن انظر إلى الجبل فإن استقر مكانه فسوف تراني فلما تجلى ربه للجبل جعله دكا وخر موسى صعقا In these or in this ayah it mentions that when Musa alayhi salam came to the appointed place and when Allah spoke to him his Lord spoke to him and Musa alayhi salam said Rabbi arini anzur ilayk my Lord, show me, allow me to look at you. Musa alayhi salam said, My Lord, show me so that I may look at you. And Allah said, Lan tarani, you shall not see me. You shall not see me. But rather look to this mountain and if it stays in its place, then you will see me. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made himself apparent to the mountain, the mountain crumbled, crumbled at the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa alayhi salam fell unconscious. In this ayah you see that when Musa alayhi salam requested to see Allah, he was told, Lan tarani, you shall not see me. And lan in the Arabic language is lil istiqbal, for future tense, the nafi, in the future tense, like you might say in English, never. I'm never going to do this or that. It's a future tense negation. They said, this means that Allah is telling Musa alayhi salam, you will never ever see me. That it's an absolute negation into the future tense. You will never ever see me, not in this world, nor in the afterlife. Because it is lan tarani, which indicates future tense negation. Now, afterlife, all of that is future tense. So they said the ayah is a clear proof that Allah is telling Musa, you will never see me, never. However... This can be refuted in multiple ways. Firstly, <coughs> linguistically, lan in the Arabic language does not indicate or mean a future tense negation to infinity, meaning never ever. It doesn't mean never ever. It means a future tense negation, but to a point. A future tense negation, but to a point. It does not mean a future tense negation without any end point, meaning forever. Doesn't mean a negation forever. And that is known in the Arabic language. Man kawni lan linnafi al muabbat. لأنه مجرد دعوة ابن مالك said ومن رأى النفي بلا مؤبدا فقوله اردد وسواه فعضدا that whomsoever thinks لن is an absolute future tense negation forever kind of negation then his statement is rejected and the statements besides him support them. Meaning the statements that say Lan is a future tense negation but not forever. They are the statements you support and you are with. 
not the statement of those who believe Lan is an absolute negation. So that is the first clear evidence in the language. The language does not support their interpretation that it means you will never ever see me. The second rebuke of them is that Musa alayhi salam, his request to see Allah, when was that? Was it to see Allah now in this world or was he requesting to see Allah in the afterlife? That request he was making was for now in this world his request was an immediate request. Now in this world it was not a request for the afterlife. So Musa alayhi salam لم يطلب من الله الرؤية في الآخرة Musa alayhi salam was not requesting from Allah to see him in the afterlife. وإنما طلب رؤية حاضرة أو رؤية حاضرة He requested to see Allah right now, there and then لقوله أرني أنظر إليك because he said show me so that I may look at you meaning right now that is not in reference to the future tense and so when Allah replied to him لن تراني that is alongside the context of the request the request was for there and then, the reply was a negation to see Allah there and then. That you cannot see Allah now. It is not possible to see Him now. يعني لن تستطيع أن تراني الآن. That you will not be able to see me now. ثم ضرب الله تعالى له مثلا بالجبل حيث تجلى الله تعالى له فجعله دكا so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this physical example to Musa alayhi salam as to why he cannot see Allah now and Allah told him look at the mountain the mountain with all of its strength power mountain and rock into the ground and yet it could not burden the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that proved therefore that Musa alayhi salam as a human and our build up is far less in power and strength than of a mountain indicating that we would certainly not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now in this world as we are. So therefore, as Shaykh al Thaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala mentions, نَقُولُ إِنَّ رُؤْيَةَ اللَّهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا مُسْتَحِيلَ We say that seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world is impossible in this world. لأن الحالة البشرية لا تستطيع تحمل رؤية الله عز وجل because the, the way that humans are made and created right now we are not capable of handling seeing Allah سبحانه وتعالى كيف وقد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن ربه عز وجل and on top of that think of what the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said about his lord حجابه النور حجابه النور لو كشفه لا أحرقت سبحات وجهه من تها إليه بصره من خلقه that the veil of Allah is light. And if he was to expose that veil, then every
everything in the eyesight as far as it goes from his creation, all of it would burn. All of it would burn was that veil removed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the veil of light. أما رؤية الله تعالى في الآخرة فممكن as for seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife then that is possible لأن الناس في ذلك اليوم يكونون في عالم في عالم آخر تختلف فيه أحوالهم عن حالهم في الدنيا Because on that day, mankind will be in another existence, different to the existence in this world and the circumstances and the state we find ourselves in this world. كما يعلم ذلك من نصوص الكتاب والسنة فيما يجري للناس في عرصات القيامة. وفي مقرهم في دار النعيم والجحيم and that is known from the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah where they highlight to us the events that will occur on the plains, on the lands of resurrection and where the people end up in blessing in paradise or in hellfire by reading those narrations you see that is a different world, a different creation altogether that the people will be in compared to this world. So the way we are then will be different to how we are now. Sheikh al um, I believe, rahimahullah, mentioned once that on the day of judgment in paradise, we will be created different to how we are now. Our eyesight will be far more powerful than what we have in this world now. Such that a person can see to great lengths and distances his kingdom in paradise. And that is from the blessings. Because if our eyesight was restricted, then it would be a restriction upon the amount of blessing we can take in. That we can only see up to a certain amount. So our eyesight is strengthened on that day so that you can see lengthy distances into your kingdom in paradise. So that is the second evidence refuting them. That Musa salam was not asking to see Allah in the afterlife. He was asking to see Allah in this life. And Allah said no. Regarding this life, and that's okay. The aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah is upon those evidences. We cannot see Allah in this world, but in the afterlife is where the affirmation is. So you can also add on as a refutation to them, istihalatu ru'iyatillahi fil akhirah, inda al munkirin laha mabniya, ala anna ithbataha. يَتَضَمَّنُ نَقْصًا فِي حَقِّ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى كَمَا يُعَلِّلُونَ نَفْيَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ وَحِينَئِذٍ يَكُونُ سُؤَالُ مُوسَى لِرَبِّهِ الرُّؤْيَا دَائِرًا بَيْنَ الْجَهْلِ بِمَا يَجِبُ لِلَّهِ وَيَسْتَحِيل فِي حَقِّهِ أَوْ الْاعْتِدَاء فِي دُعَائِهِ حِينَ طَلَبَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَلِيقُ بِهِ إِنْ كَانَ عَالِمًا بِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ مُسْتَحِيلٌ فِي حَقِّ اللَّهِ وحينئذ يكون هؤلاء النافون أعلم من موسى فيما يجب لله تعالى ويستحيل في حقه وهذا غاية الضلال The third point here is Those people of misguidance who want to claim that we cannot see Allah ever One of their reasons is that they believe and they say, if you affirm being able, then that's a deficiency to Allah. That is what they claim. And that would mean that if it's a deficiency to be able to see Allah, if we assume their 
theory is correct, that it's a deficiency, our aqidah should be, it's a deficiency to Allah if we can see him. Then that would mean when Musa alayhi salam asked to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was asking for something that is supposed to be a deficiency in Allah. Would a prophet and messenger ever ask for something of that nature? Impossible. Either you're going to have to say Musa alayhi salam knew that it's a deficiency in the right of Allah for humans to be able to see him, but still he asked anyway. He transgressed in his dua, transgressed and asked Allah to be able to see him, knowing it's a deficiency for Allah to be seen. He transgressed in his dua. That's what you're going to have to say. And if you don't want to say that, then the only other alternative you have is to say that Musa alayhi salam, the messenger sent at that time with the revelation chosen by Allah, the most knowledgeable uh, uh, from the revelation, the knowledge that Allah gave him to the level that Allah gave him, that he... When he made that dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ignorant, jahil. He didn't know that this is a deficiency to ask Allah to be able to see him. With all of the knowledge he had been given and all of the, the, the traveling that he did to seek knowledge. Who did he travel to to seek knowledge? Khidr and the scholars they say this is the first example of an evidence that it is a sunnah for you to travel to seek knowledge. We have all of the examples from the Salaf, hundreds of them, hundreds of examples from the Salaf, but before them, the scholars, they say the asal, the origin of ar-rihla fi talab al-ilm, Traveling to seek knowledge, you find it in the example of Musa alayhi salam. That he went out traveling to find that knowledge. So either you're going to have to say he was jahil and he made this dua to Allah, allow me to see you. Or you're going to have to say, because you don't want to say Musa was jahil. If you don't want to say that, you're going to have to say he was alim, he knew, but he transgressed in his dua. And asked for something he knew was haram and impermissible. Which is also impossible. So you're left with a situation of accusing Musa salam of one of two things. Either he was jahil and didn't know what he was doing asking Allah for this dua. Billah, or he was alim but he transgressed in his dua against Allah asking to see him. Both of those you see the corruption within them. Rather what we say as Ahlul Sunnah is. That Musa alayhi salam was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see Allah in this world. In this world we know it is not possible, but there is no transgression in that because in the afterlife seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is possible. وَهَكَذَا كُلُّ دَلِيلٍ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ الصَّحِيحَةِ يستدل به على أو يستدل به على باطل أو نفي حق فسيكون دليلا على من أورده لا دليلا له. So every evidence that the people of innovation try to use, whether it is this ayah لن تراني or whether it is لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار. Whichever evidence they use, if it's an authentic evidence, it will actually be a refutation upon them, not an evidence for them. Also here, a Sheikh al mentions a few other points from the people of innovation and misguidance and desires when it comes to this topic. وَأَمَّا أَدِلَّةُ نُفَاتِ الرُّؤِيَةِ الْعَقَلِيَّةِ That they have some intellectual 
evidences they believe, some logic they believe proves that we cannot see Allah. They have some intellectual evidences, some logic that they think proves you can't see Allah. So one of those intellectual or so-called logical points which they think is logical and intellectual, and of course it is not because any logic and intellect that goes against the texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah must be batil. So they believe, لَوْ كَانَ اللَّهُ يُرَى لَزِمَ أَنْ يَكُونَ جِسْمًا والجسم ممتنع على الله تعالى لأنه يستلزم التشبيه والتمثيل This is one of the ultimate problems with the people of innovation. Intellect. That's why the scholars, they say, one of their biggest problems was تقديم العقل على النقل that they give precedence to their intellect and logic over the clear texts and the evidences. They believed they were smart. They believed they were so smart, they even used to say that the manhaj of the Salaf is Aslam, but that our manhaj is Aqal. They used to say the methodology of the Salaf, the people of innovation, they would say those people, their methodology is Aslam, meaning it's safer and sounder because they stick to the texts, they stick to the narrations as they are, the names and attributes as they are, amirruha kama jaat, leave them as they are, accept them as they are, they leave it simple. Their methodology is safe. But then they would have the audacity to claim from the level of ghurur they were upon, manhajuna or tariqatuna aqal. But our methodology is more, it's a, a, a smarter and more intellectual. We look at the texts and work out things that the Salaf Masakin didn't know and they didn't work out. We get to a level with these texts that they couldn't get to. They are staying safe. But we are the ones with the real understanding. That's what they believed their level of intellect gave them. And that's why the scholars have mentioned intellect being given or being blessed with intellect is only a blessing if that intellect and smartness it guides you to the straight path and to the texts and the correct understanding. If your intellect and logic and smartness guides you away, then that is not anything praiseworthy for you. It is dispraiseworthy for you. So they used to believe their intellect and their smartness, their intelligence was superior and that they could understand things others could not. So they said, look, if you affirm that we can see Allah, then it means Allah must be a body. That Allah must be some type of tangible thing that we can look at. Because to look at something, it has to be something physical, tangible, that you can look at. Looking at the book, so here it is, I can look at the book. Looking at the phone, here it is, I can look at it. They say, if you can look at Allah then he must be like some type of body that you can look at. And they say, we can't affirm to Allah being like a body. So they say, khalas, you can't affirm seeing Allah. How can you affirm seeing Allah? You're going to affirm Allah is like a body then. We say to them, أَنَّهُ إِنْ كَانَ يَلْزَمُ مِنْ رُؤْيَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ أَنْ يَكُونَ جِسْمًا فَلْيَكُنْ ذَلِكَ لكننا نعلم علم اليقين أنه لا يماثل أجسام المخلوقين. Firstly, as Sheikh Al Thamin says, even if, even if we say that 
to be able to see Allah, it must necessitate that there is some, as they say, a jism to see. Even if that be the case, as Shaykh al says, what we know from our principles, simple and straightforward is, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ That there is nothing like unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if their argument has something in it, we would say there is no basis for any rejection here because there would be no resemblance, no comparison whatsoever between Allah and His creation. And you cannot try to imagine. The mushkila is that they always imagine to try and imagine how that would be and how this would be and your imagination is restricted. You cannot even imagine what the fruits of paradise and the blessings of paradise are going to be, let alone the creator of all of that. And this is the problem with the people of innovation. They want to try to visualize everything. So when they try to visualize things and it doesn't work, so now they have to reject everything. So we say no. Regardless of what you may say, ultimately, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ there is nothing like unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْقَوْلَ بِالْجِسَمْ نَفْيَنَ وَإِثْبَاتًا مِمَا حَدَثَ الْمُتَكَلِّمُونَ And as for this whole discussion in the first place, the jism, Allah having a jism, that is not something found in the Qur'an, nor in the sunnah, affirming it or negating it. There's no discussion on that. This was found with the philosophers, the people of rhetoric, those uh, misguided individuals started bringing out all these discussions and topics and affairs that the Sahaba never discussed and you don't find any details on it. وَقَدْ أَجَابَ النُّفَاتِ عَنْ أَدِلَّةِ أَهْلِ الْإِثْبَاتِ بِأَجْوِبَةٍ بَارِدَةٍ فَحَرَّفُوهَا تَحْرِيفًا لَا يَخْفَى عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ وَلَيْسَ هَذَا مَوْضِعُ ذِكْرِهَا and so the people of innovation, they had many different types of arguments that they brought forth. And the Sheikh says, you can find those in the bigger books of Aqeedah, where all of those arguments, one by one, are detailed, and the answers to them are detailed. At the end, the Nahiya Maslakiya, and this is important. Because it's one thing learning the correct aqidah. So we've learned we cannot see Allah in this world, but we will see Allah in the afterlife. We've learned that. And we've seen the evidences, we memorize the evidences. But there's a very important point to all of this aqidah, the nahiya maslakiya, as a Shaykh al calls it, which is what do you benefit from that? Knowing this aqidah, what do you benefit from it? Because knowing this aqidah, it should bring something for you. It's not just uh, 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 something you memorize and put aside and there's nothing, no impact on you, your worship or any. There has to be something in it. And what is in it? Knowing that you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Certainly, if a servant of Allah ponders over this tremendous reward, that you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife. Knowing that, then a person is caused to strive to a far greater degree than the one who does not recognize that. And consider as the scholars they say, you can make a dua that the people of innovation do not make. Allahumma rzuqna bi ru'yatika. Oh Allah, bestow upon us to see you. The people of innovation don't have that belief that they will ever see Allah. So you as a believer upon the correct aqidah, knowing that on yawmul qiyamah, the greatest reward you will have is to be able to see your creator. Certainly a person who ponders over that, it will increase you in your iman and it will increase you in your striving. And as the Shaykh says, this dunya kulluha rakhisa. 
all of this world becomes something cheap, of no significance. Your ultimate goal is the afterlife and to see your creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the end of the chapter in Al-Aqeedah Al-Wasatiyya regarding seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn Taymiyyah mentions at the end of it, وَهَذَا الْبَابُ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ كَثِيرٌ وَمَنْ تَدَبَّرَ الْقُرْآنِ طَالِبًا لِلْهُدَىٰ تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ طَرِيقُ الْحَقِّ That this chapter, meaning about the names and attributes on the whole, not just seeing Allah, that is one section, of all of the aspect of names and attributes of Allah, that is, فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ كَثِيرٌ it is a lot in the book of Allah. In fact, as some of the scholars mentioned, Ibn al-Qayyim and others, there isn't a single ayah in the Qur'an except that it somehow has a connection to Tawheed. Every ayah in the Qur'an has a connection to Tawheed. Even the ayat talking about marriage and divorce and all types of affairs, every ayah you'll still see at the end Finishes with the names of Allah, connecting it to the Tawheed of Allah. So this is plentiful in the book of Allah. And a person who ponders over that, and you will see all of that in the Qur'an, and you will see uh, the guidance that it brings for you. مَنْ تَدَبَّرَ الْقُرْآنَ طَالِبًا لِلْهُدَىٰ تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ طَرِيقُ الْحَقِّ that whomsoever ponders over the Qur'an seeking guidance, then the path of truth will become clear to you. The one who ponders over the Qur'an seeking guidance, then the path of truth will become clear for that person. And there are ayat in the Qur'an, as Shaykh al quotes upon this meaning, uh, regarding pondering over the Qur'an. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ And then, أَفَلَمْ يَدَّبَّرُوا الْقَوْلَ أَمْ جَاءَهُمْ مَا لَمْ يَأْتِ آبَاءَهُمُ الْأَوَّلِينَ And many other ayat uh, focusing on or talking about focusing on the Qur'an and pondering over it seeking guidance from it. That brings us to the end of that chapter. And inshallah ta'ala, that is where we'll conclude for today. And then from next week, we'll begin with the second section of the book, al wasatiya which is regarding the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will then go on to talk about the sunnah of the messenger and all types of other affairs regarding the sunnah, names and attributes continuing. Uh, that will begin with from next week, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.